Would you lend a perfect stranger a thousand dollars? Would you help them move all of their belongings across town? What if that same said perfect stranger said to you, you know, I'm, I'm going to look at a used car in a very bad part of town. Would you come with me just to help me out? Or what if that stranger said, you know, my sister's dating a really mean guy. Would you come with me because I'm going to tell him to buzz off? I think the answer is absolutely not. Unless you're an adrenaline junkie or a thousand bucks doesn't mean anything to you. Now suppose instead of that stranger, it was a childhood friend that asked you these same questions. Maybe a friend that's helped you out of a few jams over the years. Or what if this friend was also a relative of yours, either by blood or marriage? Your brother-in-law desperately needs a thousand bucks. Would you give it to him? If your grandmother asks you to come help her look at a used car, do you say, drop dead grandma? No, because it is familial ties that bind us both in support and obligation through good times and bad. And the player characters of your homebrew D&D world have those familial ties as well, with one extra bonus, storytelling gold. Hello again, folks, KR King here, helping one and all homebrew their own D&D campaign. So as you can see, I'm in the great outdoors. I'm a few miles outside of Crater Lake. I'm on the road. I thought this week that I would give an abbreviated version of my channel. I didn't want to deny my faithful viewers uh, the nuggets of my wisdom. That's the kind of guy I am. So today I'm going to talk about familial backgrounds and how they can help you develop storylines for your player characters. Because even if a character chooses as a background an orphan, they probably in that background have close friends or whatever uh, that they've met over the years. And sometimes they have surrogate father or mother figures that in some ways they bind to even more closely than traditional mother-father roles. So since most player characters aren't orphans, they do have family relations and a vast network of friends and associates, the opportunity for entanglements with those familial figures is endless. So long as you understand how those ties work and you don't overuse them. All right, so when you're creating a familial tie for a player character, there's two aspects that you want to keep track of. One is the intensity and duration of that familial tie. And the second is the urgency and the requirements of a familial tie's request for, you know, help or assistance. So in terms of intensity, we think of family relations as having the most, being the most intense. Starting with your mother and father and then going to your siblings. Traditionally, we think of the mother relationship as the most intense, but you know, it can be a father or whatever. And then again, the siblings as well. In any case, if a direct family member comes to a player character with a request for help, that player character is going to be highly motivated to honor that request. They're also going to be motivated to get the other players involved, or they're going to have to have a very good reason to say, I don't want to help this family member. So if a rogue learned every trick in her criminal bag from her mobster mother, She's not necessarily going to believe her when she approaches her and says, oh, I'm desperate, Some, I, I owe this person this money. Or at least take it with a grain of salt. Because the thing about family members is, not only do we have these close ties with them, we also know them very well. We know whether they're telling the truth or not. We know all their tricks. If the ne'er-do-well brother approaches with some elaborate scheme, the player character is going to know, I don't trust this guy. The thing is, though, this works both ways. If a player's sibling approaches the group with a treasure map, that player can instantly vouch for that uh, non-player character, their sibling's reliability. Because if I tell as the GM, that's your sister, she would never lie, the player character accepts that as truth, as does the player's. This is very powerful. The thing is, it's very important to use family ties for especially urgent or life or death uh, requests very sparingly. So, for example, if a sibling of a player character comes and says, guess what, mom is being held ransom by a beholder, that player is going to be very motivated to get involved uh, and do something. But here's the thing, that's high intensity in terms of she's being held by a beholder, high requirements. You've got to defeat or negotiate with a beholder. And the player character, of course, is highly motivated, but the player may turn to you as a GM and go, dude, my mother is being held hostage by a beholder? Really? Because the thing is, in a sandbox campaign, you want to be able to give people opportunities to back away. But this feels like railroad. So you want to use parents, uh, you know, grandparents, this sort of thing, very sparingly if they're ordinary citizens. 
Why do I say ordinary citizens? Because if a player chooses the noble background, their parents are you know, involved with the king or they are the king or something like that, now they're gonna be involved in all sorts of conspiracies and plots and maybe be ha they may be hatching them themselves. All right, so this ties into the next set of family relations. This is one generation away, uh, say cousins or uncles and whatnot. Again, this is a little more distance. You also have blood relations in terms of in-laws. Now there are cultures in the world as examples that these cousin relationships are very important, very elaborate. Uh, if a cousin comes to you with a problem, you are honor bound to help them. You can put this into your game. Some people in the old days, we used to say uh, certain races, say the dwarves really take these relationships, you know, they take these important, or we'd have some clan of humanoids or humans uh, that these relationships are very valuable. Today's game, we get away from trying to give any kind of racial characteristics, specific things. But again, it's your game, it's your fantasy. If you want to create a group and your player wants that background where these kind of relationships are important, then that cousin may come to them with a request or they can call upon cousins to help out in a dangerous situation. Okay, so next we come to friendships. And this is probably the most fruitful of all the relationships your player characters have in D&D because in the real world, we have a vast network of friendships. So first we have the, uh, you know, the duration uh, of this friendship. If you have a childhood friend that the players had who they've kept up with all these years, that's a powerful friendship. If they come requesting help or they have some, you know, they've discovered something they want to investigate, your player character is going to be highly motivated to help them out. And that childhood friend may have helped out this player sometime in the past and they may owe them a favor. And you know, the other thing about a childhood friend, if they reappear and they haven't connected in a while, but they have a memory, say some cave that they visited as children and now he suspects it's the nexus point to what, I don't know. But the important thing is it's a great storytelling device. Just ask Stephen King, does it all the time. But you know, you, and then you have non-childhood friends, maybe somebody in adolescence, they met them in school or a work friend. Let's say you have a player character with a military background and they have an old friend who appears who was in the army with them. Military friendships are very powerful. You came of age, you know, even just basic training together, uh, even if you served in peacetime, and certainly if you served in a war, you know, in a life or death situation, these are very strong bonds. Now you also have associates, and again, this is typically can be a work uh, encounter. Yeah, that guy was in my military unit. Yeah, he was okay. I, I wasn't really good friends with him. I knew that guy as a kid, or he was in my neighborhood, or a couple years ago when I lived on the other side of town, I knew the guy. These are really good for chance encounters. You just sort of run into someone, uh, you know, at the tavern or whatever. Oh, I haven't seen you in years. And then they may have some information. Now, two things here. There are no such, they're chance encounters. You're the GM, you're creating these encounters. Even if you're rolling, you know, encounter, oh, an old associate or whatever, it's not really a chance encounter. But the second thing that's cool about this is the player character has some idea of what this person's about as an associate, but not like a close friend. They know a few things, they don't know whether to trust them, and the associate doesn't necessarily know whether to trust the player. And the thing about an associate is they can have a much wider field than a close friend who may be, you know, around all the time they've seen. They may have traveled in far distances and come back to town and, oh my God, I haven't seen you in years. This gives you, the, you an opportunity when you're creating storylines to get something that's out of the ordinary. You throw these in maybe at the downtime after an adventure has ended, and again, with an associate, it's very easy for the players to go, no, that's okay. There's not urgency there with an associate so much. And that leads me to my other aspect of creating familial ties, which is the urgency of the request and the requirements it takes to do this. So in the urgency, obviously, if mom is being held hostage by a beholder, the urgency is extremely high, as are the requirements. I got to be the beholder. But you know, urgency isn't just about danger. If an old friend appears and says, oh my God, I found a map to a lost jungle temple that no one's seen in a thousand years, there's urgency there because what if other NPCs have heard about this? Uh, what if they're seen, they see someone at the tavern hanging out or following them as they're preparing for the expedition? Suddenly there's great urgency to do this. And then the requirements of this mission, if it's a jungle temple and it's a thousand miles away, that takes a little bit more uh, than if the, if the uh, a friend shows up and says, hey, could you deliver this package to for me across town or go with me across town. It's not that urgent. The players may say, well, I don't know. Because player characters know there's no such thing as just delivering a package in D&D. Something's gonna happen. There's something going on here. But again, they know the requirements are low and probably it's not gonna be some deadly encounter. Now, just as it's important to not always use, you know, family members or you know, mom and dad in some urgent situation, you also wanna use 
you know, even friends and associates sparingly. If every time an adventure ends and the players are sitting around the tavern and some old friend they hadn't seen in years runs up and says, oh my God, I've discovered a temple or so-and-so is being held hostage. The players start to go, dude, this is, okay. You're, you're doing this every time. Give us a chance. And you know what? Let the players decide. Have the, you know, friend have some mundane task. Players are going to suspect that something's going on. But here's the other thing. You can have them deliver a letter or go with them to buy something and nothing happens. It's no big deal. It's no nothing. Now they've met that old friend, though, who's now in town. Uh, they might come to the tavern every once in a while. And, and you're making your world more real that you just happen to run into old friends or whatever. It doesn't always have to be a life or death if we don't deliver the artifact. The material plane is destroyed every time. If you run your campaign on 10 all the time, it becomes exhausting. All right, so there you have some ideas on creating familial ties for your player characters that connect them to the storylines of your world. If you like my channel, please subscribe. I'm always looking for more. I love to hear your comments, and I always answer them. Most importantly, my friends, keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.